I just heard just now that Robert may be a little better again today. Well, I haven't heard this morning, but he's improving. He is making some slow, gradual improvement, so that's a good thing. Our brother Bo, sitting back there, he's had some pretty serious things. In fact, he nearly went into a coma with his blood sugar here a few days ago. If he's here, and we hope that's all better. Bo, you still scheduled for some toe surgery coming up at some point, correct? Donna Dunnigan, that's uh, Donnie and George Powers' great-granddaughter, is scheduled to have surgery on February 10th. Okay, so that's this week to remove part of a kidney due to a cancerous tumor. So let's continue to remember her. Uh, I think that's all the announcements I have. Bert, I went as slowly as I could, Bart. Are we? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's, we don't know if people that are watching, and a lot of people have called in and said for one reason or another, they were watching this morning. And so they may not be watching. <laughs> My phone will be blowing up here any minute. Anyway, let's begin our worship service with a word of prayer this morning. Almighty God, we are so grateful for this day. We are grateful for all that it means to us, for the privilege of meeting together in your name. We are awed, dear God, to know that you hear us this morning and that you are here with us. We pray your blessings upon us, dear Lord, as your people as we move forward. Please guide us and protect us. Please give us your strength and your wisdom. In all situations, please be with this congregation individually and as a whole, that we may be shining lights for your cause, no matter where we are. Dear God, please be with those who are sick and hurting, in the Walter family, Chancellor family, for Donna Dunnigan, for Matt Crandall and Ronnie McKee and others at problems, we pray, dear Lord, that you would issue them health. All things, your will be done. Dear God, please be with our country and our leaders that they may come to know you and that all of us may live in peace. Please, dear Lord, bless our military men and women around the world that are keeping us safe. Please, dear Lord, be with us in moments of temptation and we beg forgiveness of our sins. These things we pray through Christ. Amen. As the deer will be our first song. Mark, is this part working? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll sing both stands of this song. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Oh! 
to glorify your name. The greatest name ever was, or ever will be, the great I Am. We thank you so much for all that you are and all that you do for each and every one of us. We are so blessed to be able to call you our Father. We ask this morning that you continue to watch and care of those who were mentioned this morning and need our prayers. And, and we just ask that we can pray for them and, the, and also the people that are attending to them. We just also ask that you continue to be with us as we battle this virus. Hopefully, things will start turning around and get back to something normal. We just ask that you be with Ken this morning as he brings us another lesson from the life of David that we may take that and live it out in our lives and, and just know that he was a man after your own heart that we can also be that way. We ask that you continue to watch and care for our country, and that you bring our leaders to, to know you, that they can lead by your example and not by our example. We just thankful for our people overseas are, that are fighting and, and we just ask that you watch and care with them, our soldiers, to bring them back safely on their tours. We ask that you forgive us of our many sins. These things we ask in Christ's name. Next song, Lamb of God, uh, the first stanza, as you'll notice there, has two parts. Oh. Let's sing the first part of uh, verse one all together before we sing the chorus. If it's, I hope. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Your only son goes into high. You have seen it from your side who broke up on this guilty song and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of blood they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named the
of singing. I know it's a little different, but I hope you're getting accustomed to it. I, I am really grateful to the elders for uh, making steps to enhance our singing. It gives us the opportunity to have access to far more songs than our songbook. So uh, we're having a few technical difficulties this morning. Our internet uh, is a new internet, but it's only working half speed. And so we're trying to uh, make it all come together this morning. Glad you're here. I know we do have a lot of people who have uh, texted or called and said they're going to be staying home and watching on the internet this morning, and we, we understand that. And, uh, but I'm glad you're here. And as I always say, I hope you're blessed by the thoughts that we uh, try to discover from God's Word this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 16, 17, 18, and 19. It's a continuing saga of the coup against David led by his son Absalom. It's a story of David having to leave his palace, his city of Jerusalem, and make his way to a place of hiding even out into the wilderness. It's a story of Absalom making a wrong decision, taking the wrong advice. It's a story you will really remember of Absalom with all that massive head of hair riding his mule and coming under an oak thicket and getting entangled in his hair in that oak tree. And he's left dangling there by his hair. And though David is sent to his military commanders, deal gently with the young man Absalom. Joab, one of the commanders, is a ruthless, I think maybe even hard-headed person, if you know what that means. And he takes three draft javelins and he thrusts all three into the heart of Absalom and Absalom is dead. It's a story of David being sad about being driven from his home. It's a story about him being in grief and mourning over the death of his son Absalom. And finally it's a story of David returning slowly to his palace and to being king over his kingdom. But embedded in all of that is one little story among many stories that I want to bring to your attention this morning. And from that story, I want to try to make one point that I think is so very important and applicable to our lives. The story begins in chapter 16 of 2 Samuel and the first four verses you will recognize the characters of the story. Because David is away from his palace, he has all these people with him, and a man named Ziba comes with two mules loaded with supplies. He's bringing the mules so that David's people, some of his people, will have something to ride upon, and he's bringing the supplies for everyone to have something to eat. But do you recognize the name Zeba? Months ago, or at least many weeks ago, we saw David on his throne one day asking a question. Is there anyone left in the house of Saul or the house of Jonathan that I might show unto him or her the Lord's kindness? And so he calls Ziba, who was a servant of Saul, and says to Ziba, Is there anyone left? And Ziba says, Yes. There is a son of Jonathan left. His name is, do you remember? Mephibosheth. And this son of Jonathan is the one who is crippled in both feet. Because a nurse was carrying him. And when they learned of the death of Saul, they were in a hurry because the way it works in the world of that day is a new family comes to the throne. The old dynasty, the family of the old dynasty is completely annihilated. They thought he would be killed. And so she dropped him along the way, became crippled in both feet. And he lives in a place called Lodibar, a place that's desolate and far away and you get the strong sense that Mephibosheth has been hiding all these years. Not wanting to see David. Not wanting to know David to know that he existed. Because he thinks he'll be killed. 
By this time he has a family. When David learns of Mephibosheth, he sends people to get Mephibosheth. They go to Lodibar. They bring him back from the house of Maker. And we know from the story that Mephibosheth is greatly afraid, and rightfully so, because he thinks he's finally been found out, and he thinks he will die. But to his great delight and surprise, you remember what David does? He said, yeah, it's, I, I'm going to give unto you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. And I'm going to let you sit at my table as if you were one of my sons and let you eat from my table from this day forth. And we made the point a long time ago when we covered that part of the story that this is an act of great kindness and graciousness on the part of David. But now in chapter 16, Ziba is out there. And you have to wonder, if Ziba is a servant, he and his sons to Mephibosheth, are the mules that he is bringing to David, do they really belong to Mephibosheth? And, and you kind of have to wonder, are all these food supplies, does it really belong to Mephibosheth? And David must be wondering something like that, because he says to Ziba, where is Mephibosheth? Why isn't he here? Now, before we read the response, I want you to know that Ziba is a liar. And I want you to know that Ziba is an opportunist. And Ziba is filled with greed. And sometimes greed knows no limits. Greed will do anything it can do inside of us to make us get more of what we want. It will even cause us to belittle other people, to slander other people, so that we might get benefits. That's exactly what happens. I want you to hear what he says. The king then asks, where is your master's grandson? Where is Saul's grandson? Where is Mephibosheth? And Ziba said to him, he is staying in Jerusalem because he thinks today... The Israelites will restore to me my grandfather's kingdom. He thinks he's going to become king. He thinks this coup is going to destroy you and he'll be destroyed, absolutely destroyed, and he'll need to become king. Then the king said to Zebra, All that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. I humbly bow, Zebra said. May I find favor in your eyes, my lord the king. We know, don't we, that David is an impulsive person. David, like Peter in the New Testament, is an impulsive person. I am an impulsive person. Everybody remember that? Long, long time ago, my father-in-law said, why don't you take this little Cessna 172 to Lubbock, and why don't you learn to fly it, and you just keep it out there and fly. You fly back and forth to Cornell, fly where you need to fly. And I was thinking, that's a pretty slick idea. And Sue said, you go ahead and do it. But I will never, ever fly with you. She said, because you're too impulsive. You'll see something on the ground and say, look down there. Shoo, and there we go. And she said, I'm not flying with you. Never. I'm an impulsive person too. I, David makes a snap decision, it seems to me. I'm taking everything away from a finish up. I'm giving you, Ziva. But now you go to chapter 19. You begin verse 24. And now David is finally really getting close to Jerusalem. People are coming out everywhere. And, and they are watching the king as he comes back. And Mephibosheth comes out. But Mephibosheth is a pitiful sight. It, it says that Mephibosheth has not taken care of his feet. Now I don't know what that means. But apparently there was something he could do to take care of his feet that made him less crippled. It says he had not trimmed his mustache. He had not washed his clothes. Now, David's been gone a long time. He's looking at this point like a sad character. A pitiful character. And there he is waiting for David. And when David arrives, David has this question. 
Why didn't you come with me, Mephibosheth? Now, I, I, that's, that's, that's a good question. Why didn't you come with me, Mephibosheth? Do you, do you have any thought? Do you wonder what David is thinking? Mephibosheth, I could have killed you. But I gave you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. I let you eat at my table. Where was your loyalty? Why didn't you come with me? I want you to listen to Mephibosheth's response. My lord, the king, since I, your servant, am lame, I said, I will have my donkey saddled, I will ride on it, so I can come with the king. But Ziba, my servant, betrayed me. He has slandered your servant to my lord, the king. My Lord the King is like an angel of God. So do whatever you wish. All my grandfather's descendants deserve nothing but death from my Lord the King. But you gave your servants a place among those who eat at your table. So what right do you think I have to make any more appeals to the king? David said to him, Why say more? I order you and Ziba to divide the land. Now, again, I, I, I just stop there and say I don't understand David. Maybe there's more to the story, I don't know. But why did Ziba get anything? Why did Ziba kill? Maybe it's another impulsive, rash decision, or maybe I just don't have all the facts. But it just doesn't seem right that. Half the land goes to Ziba after what he's done. But then Mephibosheth comes back and says, I don't care. I don't care if I get anything as long as my lord the king is back on his throne. I don't care about the land. Now, as you view Mephibosheth, what do you see? Do you see a man who is Faithful to his king? Do you see a man who is loyal to his king? Do you see a man who is steadfast in his following of David? He's all of it. Those are words that we've been hearing as long as we can remember, aren't they? If you've been, as we say in a kind of a loose language, going to church, as long as you've been going to church, have people been talking about the need for Christians to be faithful? Have they been talking about the need for Christians to be loyal? Have they been talking about the need for Christians to be steadfast in what they do? Loyal and faithful and steadfast. Even when times are difficult, even when times are really bad, even when things are not going right in any sense of the way, do you ever have difficulty with that? I do. There are times that faithfulness is not easy. And there are times that being loyal is not easy. And there are times I get all kinds of questions rolling around in my mind. Like, why does it seem right now that evil is winning? And, and why is it that, that God is answering our prayers the way I think it should go? And, and, and why are all these problems ganging up at one time upon me? And it's easy at those thoughts for us to become weary, as the scripture says, in our well-doing. It's so easy to become weary in our well-doing. Here's what I want you to hear. I, I don't know if I'll explain this well or not. But if you are trying to live in faithfulness, and you are trying to live with loyalty and steadfastness, by your own willpower, by your own willpower, it will never work. It will never completely work. Because our willpower is limited. 
Our willpower will only take us so far. Almost every evening, I find that my willpower is weak. Because almost every evening, I make up my mind, after I eat my evening meal, I will not snack. How long do you think that lasts? That lasts no time. I mean, here I go, and I'm rating this, or I'm rating that, and, and, and my pants are getting tighter, and, and I have no willpower. It'll only take me so far. So how, how do I, in such a difficult circumstance, remain faithful and steadfast and loyal? Now I see it, I see it right there. I see it in Mephibosheth, don't I? I mean, in reality, this story that Ziba tells that he will become the king in place of his grandfather, that's absurd. What is likely going to happen is, if Absalom wins, he's dead. Because Absalom is ruthless, and Absalom will kill all the Saul's family. And he's got everything to lose. And yet, he remains so loyal to David, even though it appears to everyone that David will never be on the throne again. He is so loyal, and he's so faithful. Why? Why? Out of his own mouth, he says it. Because you extended to me grace. You gave to me grace. I deserve, this is what Mephibosheth said, I deserve to be put to death. Every descendant that my grandfather saw deserved to be put to death. But you gave me a place at your table. And that's all Mephibosheth seems to be able to think about is how good David had been to him. And that promoted in his life, regardless of what happened to him. He said, if I don't have anything left, I want you to be king. I will be faithful, loyal, and steadfast. That's his attitude. Now that is the secret for us this morning. I am now convinced, it's only my opinion, it's only my theory. The theory is something that hasn't been proved wrong, by the way. You may be able to prove me wrong, I'm not sure. But I believe that it's only a constant focus on the grace of God that has been extended to us that will allow us under any circumstance, even the worst of circumstances, to remain faithful. To remain loyal, to remain true to our God. Now, what am I talking about? We, we talk about it every week. We talk about it every week. And because we talk about it every week, and because we talk about it around the Lord's table all the time, I'm afraid we forget. I'm afraid we take it for granted. But the truth of the matter is, you and I are sinners. We're sinners. And it's, it's, it's not a matter of how much we sin. It's just a matter of sin. And God is so holy and so perfect that He cannot tolerate sin, cannot touch sin. And so everything that touches sin, He can't touch. That's why we were alienated from God. As we like to say, we were lost. We're absolutely lost. And what does it mean to be lost? It means to face judgment someday. And it means to be punished for a long, long time. It means something horrible. But God loved all of us. And He did send His Son. He didn't have to. Jesus didn't have to come. We didn't deserve it. Not one of us is good enough that we deserve anything from God. And so God gave us His Son so that we might be, as we say, saved. We may be, we may be purchased. We might become His children, dearly loved by Him. That is the story of the grace of God. That is grace. 
I was lost, but I've been found. I was dead, and now I'm alive. What an amazing thing. I was nothing, and now I'm a child of God. I was nothing, and now I get to sit at our Lord's table week after week after week and every day of my life in reality. I am watched over. I am cared for. I am loved. I am protected by the God who created this world. And I didn't deserve it. That's the story of God's grace. That's God's grace. Now when I focus on that grace, it allows me to naturally and more easily, even when life is so difficult, to remain faithful and true and loyal. You've heard me say before that one of my more favorite passages in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10. Paul was talking about the fact that he's an apostle. He's always having to defend that fact. I, I, he's not an apostle like the original 12. He was chosen later. And so people would sometimes try to discredit him. He would also discredit himself because of his background. You see, Paul knew just how bad he was before Jesus Christ. So here's how he says it. I am the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the Christians. You know what he's talking about, really? I killed Stephen. I killed Stephen. I was responsible for the death of Stephen. I was responsible for the imprisonment of many. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. But listen how he says it. But I am what I am today by the grace of God. And that grace is not without effect. It caused me to work harder than everyone else. It caused me to do all these other things. Not trying to get himself better with God. Not, not trying to earn anything. I just know what God did for me. And it caused me to be different in this life. Have you ever thought about Paul's life? Really thought about it? I wonder if he had happy times. I'm not sure he did. Sure he had those days where they were wonderful. But about all we ever read about are difficult times. In jail, stoned, shipwrecked, being chased by people, being slandered by people, all because he is a follower of Jesus Christ. And yet, he fights the good fight and he keeps the faith. He finishes his course. He hangs in there faithful, it's called. Loyal, it's called. True, it's called. Why? Because he knew what he was. And he knew what God did for him and what he became. And it changed the way he looked at all of life. Now, if you and I want to be faithful, loyal, true, regardless of circumstances, and even greater than my own willpower will let me become. The solution is to focus on the grace of our God. I was lost. I've been found. I was dead. I am alive. Look what God has done for me. So my opinion, it's only a healthy, constant focus on God's grace in our lives that promotes true faithfulness, loyalty, and steadfastness. And we think a lot of things we come around this table, a lot of things. But you know what we really ought to be thinking more than anything else that along with everything else? 
This is a reminder of the grace of our God. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to send his son, but his son came. His son didn't have to come, but he came. He didn't have to be nailed to a cross. I don't like to be stuck with an evil. But to be nailed to a cross? He didn't have to be whipped. But he did. It was all a gift. That I might live differently and better and be blessed day by day in this life and that I might go to my grave knowing that there is something far greater waiting for me. It's all a gift. I don't want to ignore that gift. So think about the grace of God that promotes our lives faithfully when we take the Lord's Again, Father, we are so thankful, Father, for all that you do for us. We are thankful, Father, for this time to continue our thoughts, continue our focus on the pain, focus on the suffering, focus on the love you have for each one of us through the sacrifice of your Son. As we take this through the vine, I pray, Father, you be with us, bless us, and in Jesus' name I pray. I know things are a little bit awkward with the numbers that we have and people being called and people using the live streaming. But this, uh, this pandemic continues to affect us. It's getting better, I think, but it continues to affect us. So I, I appreciate you coming. I appreciate you being a part of all this. And uh, I hope you've been blessed by being here. I, I really hope that all of us, and I know all of us here, are in Christ. But I really hope that people watching, people all over the world understand the graciousness of God and can respond to it. We'll be followers of Christ, be immersed in the possession of Christ, and we'll live faithfully. One day Jesus is coming again. One day He will come again. And I hope we're all ready. So if we can help you in any way, we would be happy to do so. Let's First stanza only of His grace reaches me. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sin from the Father and it thrills my soul just to feel it.
all the honor. Thanks for the day and thanks for the opportunity we've had to come together to worship you with our Easter and in church. Then, Father, we want to continue to pray for those of our number that we've been mentioned that are fighting this virus or recovering from surgeries. We pray that you heal them and comfort them and their families as only you can. Continue to be with each and every one of us. Bless us. Help us to be those humble and kind people that you have us to be. So those we come in contact with can see you living in us. 